Stephen Kocher was born in 1979 in Amarillo, Texas, one of four children of Rolf and Diane Kocher. He was active in the Boy Scouts, eventually making Eagle Scout. After graduating from Amarillo High School in 1998, Kocher, a devout Mormon, attended First Ricks College and later the University of Utah, where he received a degree in communications. He performed his missionary work in Brazil and learned to speak Portuguese. After college, Kocher interned in the office of the Governor of Utah for nine months. A year and a half later, he went to work for the Davis County Clipper, a bi-weekly newspaper edited by his father. Coach remained there for another year and a half with some articles he worked on receiving awards from the Utah Press Association. In 2007, Coacher began working for the Salt Lake Tribune's Digital Advertising Division. He liked the work, according to his mother, but not working the overnight shift. The many temperature inversions in the Salt Lake City area that winter also bothered him, so after a year he decided to leave his job at the Tribune and relocate to St George. Coacher initially worked with another internet advertising firm, Matchbin, but that employment soon ended after he relocated. With the Great Recession underway, it was difficult for him to find a new job. Coacher was able to find some work handing out flyers for a local window washing firm. It did not, however, provide him with enough income to meet his expenses. And by November 2009, he was several months behind on his rent. On December the 10th, 2009, Coacher apparently left St George in the early morning hours and drove his Chevrolet Cavalier 300 miles north on Interstate 15 to Salt Lake City, where he bought some gas with a debit card. He then travelled west on Interstate 80, another 125 miles to West Wendover, where he again pulled off the highway to refuel. After that, he continued another 100 miles to the Ruby Valley Ranch of the Neff family. Coacher had in the past dated Anna Marie Neff and visited the ranch. He told her parents, who had not been expecting him, that he thought he would stop in to see her. She was not there, but the Neffs served Coacher lunch anyway. He told them he was on his way to visit family in Sacramento, but was not certain whether he could continue in that direction due to bad weather. After two hours, he left and decided to return to St George, the way he had come, stopping to buy gas again in Salt Lake City and Springfield, followed by dinner at Taco Time in Nephi. By the time Coacher returned home, he had driven nearly 1,100 miles. During the day, Coacher talked with his mother on the phone. The two discussed his plans for returning to the family's home for Christmas. Coach's mother said he seemed upbeat about the upcoming holiday and his job prospects despite his financial difficulties. He did not tell her of his road trip that day. The next day, while handing out flyers for his employer, Coach encountered two young girls who had been locked out of the family's apartment. Learning of their plight, he tried to call their mother when she did not answer, he looked for somebody in the neighbourhood who could take them in temporarily until someone arrived who could let them in. That same day, Coacher spoke with his ward's bishop, who also described Coacher's mood as positive. The bishop was also trying to help him and had promised Coacher he would have a job available by the beginning of 2010. On December the 12th, Coacher again hit the road. That morning, his phone pinged a cell tower near Overton, Nevada, at the north end of Lake Mead. In the evening, he bought gas and snacks at a convenience store in Mesquite, Nevada, along I-15, just over the Arizona state line. Why Coacher went to Nevada that day is unknown. Three hours after his mesquite purchase, Coacher bought a baby's bib and cookies, believed to be Christmas gifts for his brother and his family, whose names he had drawn in the family's 
annual Christmas gift exchange at a Kmart outside St George. A neighbour of coaches recalled seeing him return to his apartment around 10pm. A half hour later he left again. While he was not seen to return later that night, it was possible he could have. The next morning, December the 13th, Webb called Coacher saying he was on his way back from Las Vegas and feared he might not make it to St George in time for the 11am service, asking Coacher if he could lead it in his absence. Coacher said he too was in the Las Vegas area, 150 miles away, but would return home if needed. Webb told him not to worry and that he would try to get back in time. Another ward member called again later that morning with a similar request, which they dropped when Coacher told them where he was. Neither he nor Webb asked Coacher why he had gone to Las Vegas that morning. They found nothing unusual about their conversations with him. At 11.55am, a home security camera on Savannah Springs Avenue in Sun City, a retirement community in the Anthem development in Southern Henderson, recorded Coach's car driving into the cul-de-sac, where it was later found. Six minutes later, a figure believed by his family to be Stephen, wearing a white shirt and slacks, walked the opposite direction down the sidewalk in front, carrying something in one hand that appeared to be a file folder or portfolio. Shortly afterwards, another security camera in a garage on Evening Light Street caught his reflection as he walked north. Coacher has not been seen since. Coacher's phone remained active. Around 5pm that day it pinged a tower at the intersection of Arroyo Grand Boulevard and American Pacific Drive, more than 10 miles northeast of where he had parked. Two hours after that it pinged another tower near Henderson's Whitney Ranch subdivision, two miles north of the previous ping. Early the next morning, the phone pinged a tower at the interchange between Interstate 515, US Route 93 and Russell Road, two more miles to the north. Coach's landlord sent a text and then an hour later, his phone was used to check the voicemail. The phone remained in that tower's vicinity for the next two days, suggesting that its battery died. There has been no activity on the phone since. A day after the last ping, Sun City's Homeowners Association Parking Enforcement took note of the car at the end of the Savannah Springs cul-de-sac and tried to find its owner. Through the windows they saw one of the flyers Coacher had been distributing for the window washing company in St George and called the number on it. Eventually they spoke with the owner who gave them Coacher's cell phone number where they left a voicemail. Later they called his mother. She returned their call on December the 17th and realising no one else in the family had talked to him in a week and were unable to locate him, reported him missing. Coach's brother and sister drove to St George from the Salt Lake City area to start searching. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police canvassed the houses in the neighbourhood where Coach's car had been parked. With the help of volunteers, they used helicopters, all-terrain vehicles and sniffer dogs. By Christmas, the media in Salt Lake City and Las Vegas had begun reporting the story. A local dairy put Coach's picture on a milk carton and the LVMPD put a video with information on the case on its YouTube channel. In April 2010, another party of searchers scoured the open desert south of the Henderson Executive Airport to the west of where Coacher had parked in response to a tip passed along to a former police officer working as a private investigator for the family. 
A group of 70 covered about a half mile sketch in two hours. Bone fragments were later found but they turned out not to be human. Coach's family believes, given his financial circumstances at the time, that he had gone to Henderson that morning for a job opportunity. Despite the odd location where he parked his car, on the video, the neatly dressed coacher is walking purposefully, suggesting he knew where he was going and what he was going there for. He doesn't look confused or dazed, Stephen's brother Dallin said in 2018. But beyond that, there is no evidence to suggest what happened afterwards, nor has anything emerged which could. We know about as much now as we did the second we realised he was gone. The St George police detective in charge of the case said in 2008, Coach's family does not believe he chose to voluntarily disappear in order to escape them or take his own life. His mother said that in the last conversation with him on December the 10th, he was optimistic about his ability to find another job and the two were making plans for his Christmas visit home. Stephen's car and its contents also suggest he intended to return to St George. His father said that the car was in full working order and the gas tank was half full when he reached it on December the 17th. In the car were Christmas presents Stephen had bought for his brother and his family at Kmart the previous day, as well as job applications and the flyers from his employer. At Coach's apartment, his clothing and possessions remained where he stored them and had not been disturbed or packed. Coach's unusual and mostly unexplained travel in the days leading up to his disappearance has led to suggestions that he may have turned to some sort of illicit activity for income. A drug dog was taken to sniff over his car but did not alert on anything. Another vehicle seen on the security camera footage driving up and down the street around the time coach parked and walked away from his car was investigated and turned out to be a local real estate agent showing a house in the area. Checks of coach's financial history and phone records turned up nothing unusual aside from the trips. A single charge to his credit card since the disappearance was just an automatic charge made to web hosting company GoDaddy, ensuing from his days at Matchbin. One unknown phone number turned out to be the family of the two girls Coacher had been helping get back inside on the day before he went to Las Vegas. A search of Stephen's computer and internet browsing history found nothing unusual. Investigators also checked his borrowing history at the St George Library and found nothing there that suggested any unexplored leads. Coacher kept a diary but recorded no problems in his life at the time of his disappearance, beyond his monetary issues and his ongoing bachelorhood, neither of which he believed would last much longer. The family does not consider Coacher's travel to be particularly unusual either. One of his reasons for moving to St George was to research family history in that area. He often went on tours of cemeteries looking for ancestors' graves. Coach's mother believes the trips were just his way of keeping himself busy despite his underemployment. While there is no evidence that would suggest Coacher was murdered or kidnapped, neither the St George nor the Henderson police have found any evidence to eliminate that possibility. There's nothing that makes us suspicious, a detective from the former department told the Las Vegas Review-Journal, but at the same time, it's a strange situation.